Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focus Compounding, sitting next to Jeffrey Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? Uh, it's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. Hope it's going great for everybody else. Were you so pumped to see Tom Brady win the Super Bowl again last night? Uh, I did not see the Super Bowl. You did not see the Super Bowl. Did you it know? It was on in the background won? where I was. But oh, yeah. okay. Because so, right. I was at a restaurant. So okay, they were doing so all to go business. So it took half an hour to get my food. But, oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was so excited. It was an awesome game. But there you go. That's good. You, so you, you knew the Super Bowl was going on. I did know the Super Bowl was going on. You yeah. knew the Super Bowl was going on. Great. Well, um, if this is the first time you're tuning in with us, the best way you could support everything we're doing here is hit that subscribe button on the podcast app, iOS, Spotify, YouTube, and leave us a rating review. That goes a very long way. So in today's podcast, we're going to be talking about a stock that you recently wrote up on the premium side of focused compounding, and that is Alico. You said a Florida orange grower selling land, paying down debt, and focusing on its core business. Mm -hmm. I came across this company yes, probably about this time last year. You're the one I said yesterday. Yeah, yeah I came across this, la uh, this time last year. I thought it was an interesting business, mainly because I love OJ and their biggest okay. customer, Tropicana, mm -hmm. OJ. They're a supplier for them. Um, and I thought it was interesting. And for whatever reason, too, I feel like I've been coming across so many companies in Florida. Right. When you sent me this article yesterday, I was like, should I really plan a trip to Florida? Because right. I feel like the past like three or four or five companies I've looked at have been headquartered in Florida. We yeah, can seriously we... do a research trip there and... I swear we could do two weeks there pretty easily. Yeah. And in fact, there was a podcast a little while ago we did where we talked about Universal Insurance, which is a Florida company. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so Alico, so how did you come across it? Was it a Valley Investors Club? Did it come up on the screen? Take me through the beginning and let's talk about the company. Well, you suggested it to me. Okay. And then so I looked at it sweet. and I didn't like what I saw at first mm -hmm. in that it was one of these like Maui Land and Pineapple like uh, cool, K-E-W-L, things like that. Um, basically, value investors liked it because it was trading at discount to the value of its land if it sold off the land. Um, the stock had not done well over decades. Um, now, it did pay a dividend, and it's paid a dividend for many, many years, uh, like almost 50 years. Um, but it just didn't look that great from that perspective. So from what I saw in the investor presentation and from that. But then as I dug into it a little bit more, I realized that there were some things that seemed to be changing with the company. And so that got me more interested in the things that were changing. Like what, their investor relations presence? Because it's a pretty pumpy uh, it is investor now. Yeah. presentation. Yeah. So I don't know all the details of that. And I didn't want to get into them in the article. Um, there had been investors involved with this company, a fund that dis that dissolved and distributed shares to different people. So you'll see people on the board um, and different people listed as owning percentages of the stock that are people who own those percentages because they received them when the fund uh, dissolved. And there was a, some lawsuits and significant legal expense associated with that um, in past years. And the company had historically been involved in some other things besides just uh, growing oranges. And then they bought some orange groves, made some operational changes, and started talking about themselves more as just uh, an orange company. And they pretty aggressively sold off some of their other stuff, which is basically ranch land. And they killed a plan they had for a water thing and sold off the land. And um, on that basis, I was a little more interested in it because it's not necessarily a terrible business uh, growing oranges for um, not from concentrate orange juice. And then the asset becomes somewhat more interesting. Like I had written up, cool, I'd written up a Timberland company because Timberland is a little more interesting as a real estate play because it is not a bad asset long term. This has similar um, features to that. They call this a permanent crop, you know, because it's planting trees that are permanently um, uh, producing as opposed to like farming, basically. So, that, you know, they talk about that. You have to wait about four years from when you plant till you get any production from the tree. And then it's about four years after that, that it peaks. Um, so that was all interesting. The book value uh, and the stock trades fairly close to book is all the actual um groves basically the actual capitalized cost of the groves it really doesn't have anything to do with the land and i talked about that so the land is probably carried on the books at um like 90 uh, percent less or even lower than that of what it's worth um and it's similar to maui land and pineapple and cool in that 
It has a history. You can read about this on a Value Investors Club thing about it. I didn't go into the history, but it has a history from long ago as to why it has the land it has. And it's similar to those things in that it's a totally unrelated business that ended up leaving a company with a bunch of land and had to decide what to do with that land. Um, so again, book value means nothing here. Uh, as I said in the article, they've sold some land for $2,500 an acre that was clearly on the books for less than $150 an acre. Mm-hmm. Do you like that it's more of a pure play going forward then since they were doing a bunch of different things and now it sounds like they're really just yes. going to be more of the orange groves? Yes, I do like that. Um, and it also interested me because of the potential of um, the stock might trade based on those earnings and things like that. So, you know, it's a pure commodity thing. I talk about in the article, you can't really vary supply um, to meet changes in demand. So there, it's very significant. I would say more than 20% a year movements in production and more than 20% a year movements in price happen all the time. So there'll be some years where weather and stuff means you're going to produce 20% less oranges than you plan to. Uh, or you normally had over time. And then also the price could be weaker in that same year um, and vice versa because like inventories could have been too high. There could be some reason why aren't just declined or increased. There's some other countries that um, export into the U.S., things like that. Do you like a company like this where they have a business on top of you know the land, for example, yeah. as opposed to a company like Maui Land and Pineapple, which by the way, that's probably like the coolest public company name ever just right. to say that but where really a lot of their revenue comes from when they sell off the land right yes i do however maui land pineapple is much much cheaper than this this is not very cheap um the the this is cheap versus other stocks today but as a way to purchase the land is not very cheap i think i talked about how different ways you could calculate it you could probably create a like um valuation where you think you're getting the land at five thousand dollars an acre for the citrus groves and the company says they're worth eight to ten thousand. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's much more in line with like the uh, price to appraisal that we talked about with Cool, where you're getting at a two thirds or something of what the timberland might be worth. Maryland and pineapple is much much uh, cheaper. Mm-hmm. For yeah. people listening, if you're not watching on the screen, Jeff said market cap is 230 million. There's 45,000 acres of orange groves. So 230 million divided by 45,000 acres is being priced currently at $5,100 an acre. This is less than the company says the land is worth, which they claim it's worth $8,000 to $10,000 an acre. And they go into all of this, make it very obvious in their investor presentations, which is quite honestly what caught my eye uh, when I first came across this yeah, company about a year ago. Yeah, that's slide that worried me, yeah. <laughs> is that one. There's a slide where they basically give fair market value of what they think it's where They sort of say, and then they compare it to their own stock and then say, this is how much cheaper we are in the market than the value of these things. Mm-hmm. And that obviously worries you because if they're going to keep that slide in there, what are they going to do when their stock goes up? So if their stock goes up, they're just like magically taking. You know what out. I mean? If your stock goes up, to are they going to keep that slide in there to say uh, the market cap of our company is twenty percent more than we're worth? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Are they going to take the slide out and yeah. never mention again? That's what you know. That's do. the problem that you get yourself into when you start doing that. Um, the uh, as I pointed out, they have bought some citrus stuff that was actually less than what they say it's worth. There's pr- perfectly good reasons why they might have done that. And so, but I just mean, it's not, we can see that there are sometimes sales at less than $8,000 an acre. So it's not, it's, it's just not in any way as cheap as like Maui Land and Pineapple, I think. Um, but they are focusing on stuff that makes a lot more sense. They're a very big producer. Mm-hmm. I think they say they might have 10 or 11% market share or something like that. They're obviously many times bigger than many of the growers in the area. So they're one of the bigger growers. You ever seen it like an orange field in person? Uh, no. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah, it's so cool. Yeah. I know you, when I was in Florida, we drove past one. I was like, that is beautiful. Well, you could drive. You, there's many, many thousands of acres of this one. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, what and, about the customer concentration? Yeah. So customer concentration risk, I don't think it's something to worry about one way or the other. This is a commodity. Tropicana has to buy at commodity type prices. They have to sell at commodity type prices. I don't really see a difference. I think things like tariffs and stuff like I talked about are more of a factor to consider. And that the earnings are entirely unreliable from year to year. So you have to figure that out yourself. But it's a commodity, basically. They sign like five-year, or it's I think sometimes mm-hmm. it's actually like four-year contracts, but I said basically like five-year contracts uh, with Tropicana. But if you look at them, they don't even include a firm price. What they are is there's a price that it sets it at based on market prices, basically. And then after that, 
there's a percentage uh, over or under the price that you get. So it's basically like outside of a price range, the market price still is shared kind of 50-50 between them. So it's not like you're completely hedging out the risk in these supply agreements that orange juice prices could fall by half or rise by half. And I looked at what the um, very long-term pricing was on it and stuff like that uh, because the USDA has detailed information about that. The USDA predicts the crop every year. In fact, I think it predicts it. Um, it updates its predictions. It might be monthly. It might be. It's not just annually that they do it. So they have very detailed predictions on that. The company goes into it. The company gives guidance. Um, very detailed guidance, actually, uh, which is interesting. And they probably can do that, you know, for a year. But then I just think the issue is that you can't really guide for years two, three, four, because you have no idea what the weather will be. You have no idea what the the um, other commodity factors will be involved in it. So that's the problem. Mm -hmm. You really break down in the article, which I like. So you said, so is the stock cheap? And then you go into whether you think it's cheap or not. You said that it is cheap versus the company the company's fair value that they provided for the land, but you don't think it's liquidating. So you don't think it's like buying a dollar for 65 cents, right. for example. Um, is it, is the business good? And this is just like a great, like boom, boom, boom and support your thesis, right? Like, is it cheap? Is the business good? Blah, blah, blah. Um, is the business good? You said, depends. I think the business is getting better here. The company, there's a whole past history with a group of investors, lawsuits, uh, dissolution of a partnership that controlled a lot of the stock, changes in the board, et cetera. I'm not getting into. Uh, you said, it has a strategy, is executing on that seems much smarter than what Alico has been doing historically. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about that. Why do you think that? Well, so compared to something else that's a real estate thing, like we said, like Maui Land and Pineapple, people have no idea what their plan is. I mean, they have a plan that they show in the 10K or whatever to develop over 20 years or something, mm -hmm. but there's really no detail on it. Here, they're focusing on citrus stuff in um, Florida, and it's all going to be basically the same thing. You know, they're still going to be selling under the same conditions and stuff, so you can kind of figure that out. Uh, they, my feeling is, which I talked about here, I think what they'll do is they'll sell off ranch land and anything else, and there's not really anything else left, um, and put the proceeds into orange groves to the extent they can, and then to the extent they can't, that defers taxes and stuff, and to the extent they can't, then they have to um, pay down their debt or when it's the land's encumbered and stuff. So they'll pay down debt, and they'll uh, switch to owning more orange groves. That's what I think is going to happen. So you kind of have an idea about capital allocation. Mm -hmm. And then I also talked about you can borrow against land like this at pretty good rates for pretty long periods of time, especially long periods of time. So I th think the cost of capital for maybe a third of the funding could be pretty low. And I don't know that this company will ever like operate with net cash and things like that. Um, there's nothing in the way it's been running things that suggests that. Like they've raised their dividend pretty aggressively and stuff. Um, and paid it very consistently. Too. Yeah. So I just think... Like it's not like they do a special dividend much. It's just I don't, all consistent. I don't think it's the best asset that you could get in terms of the land. And I don't think it's the cheapest in terms of land. I think there are other stocks that are land banks or whatever you want to call them that you could buy for cheaper and in some cases have better assets long term. Um, but the capital allocation here is more like in a direction that a lot of investors will like. They'll feel like, you know, stuff's happening. And, and then, of course, the company's now being very public, um, pushing its story. It has an investor presentation. Uh, it's giving guidance. It's doing uh, quarterly earnings calls. It's had a couple of them already. So that's a big change. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, I think it's a fairly overlooked stock now or was, but it'll probably become not overlooked. Is this a situation where Buffett likes companies when, okay, so they've been operating for a while and then they make some sort of change in capital allocation? Would you consider that the same here? Mm -hmm. That's what interested me about it. Um, to see if you understand what the cap allocation is going to be. For instance, they're now managing uh, groves for someone else, which really has a nice focus on what they're doing. And there are economies of scale in that. And then you ask, like, well, can they get their price per pound down below others? I get into that a little bit. Major thing here is that the variable cost of um, growing oranges is very low versus the fixed cost. My best guess was that 70% of cost is completely fixed. So in other words, it doesn't matter how many oranges you're going to produce, doesn't matter what price you can sell them at, your grove 
cost is basically fixed, and that is actually more than two thirds of what they're putting in as their cost of goods sold. The stuff that changes is like the hauling and all that sort of stuff. So very volatile. Mm-hmm. You can see that in the, re- the return on invested capital and all that. So it's very volatile commodity type thing. Not a business I would generally be that interested in. Um, obviously, it would be a big beneficiary if there's significant inflation. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about some other companies that people reach out and ask you about, mm-hmm. uh, you know, quote unquote value stocks. Um, uh, CPHC, Canterbury Park Holdings Corporation. Yeah. They have real estate, which is why people ask about it. Mm-hmm. Land, card casino. Yeah. It's, I mean, poker. It, yeah. And uh, horse racing. Horse track. racing, yeah. Yeah. But the value is basically in the card casino and the um, development of land. Correct. So of all the real estate things I've seen, I like their land's development plan the best. I guess we should say, full disclosure, we've visited we've the company. Seen the, we've seen that what they're yes. doing, yeah. Um, mainly why I like it, though, it has nothing to do with that. It's the way they structured things. So a problem with a company like the one we just talked about is there's some leakage due to tax things and leverage things and stuff. Um, some companies are really bad that way. They lose a lot out in taxes and things like that. Um, they don't just focus on uh, maximizing value. They may also focus on reported earnings and things like that. So the way that Canterbury Park has done it has been the smartest in that they've been willing to take, where possible, equity stakes in joint ventures developing on their land. So they swap land for a partial interest in an apartment building, a partial interest in commercial real estate on the land, a partial interest, which is by far the way to do it for tax reasons it's like a capital contribution well for tax reasons and also i think that they're swapping it at a valuation that will be higher for them in the future than now because raw land when you're picking someone to develop and stuff is going to have a higher value what they give you for it in a negotiation than just selling the raw land now sometimes they're just selling the raw land to a home builder or something and that then it is what the land's worth but as someone letting them develop the land um working with them to get a partial equity stake in the project long term is just, you know, makes a lot more sense. And that was my question to you too, right? It's like, does the back half of your acreage, like portfolio become more valuable as you continue to develop the whole area around it? Right. It might. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course you own partial things in the equity stakes, but lots of reasons why companies don't do that. It'll complicate things. It'll really complicate their reporting. It'll confuse investors. Investors won't want to own a casino that also owns apartment buildings and commercial real estate with rents coming in from that well, yeah they're going to start to hear a lot of investors say well you should spin off this because it'll trade at yep. different they'll you know, do some of the part though. things you know yeah. so if you'll have value investor club Can't write-ups and it. things that yeah. say like well the EBITDA multiple on this stock is whatever, you can't do that anymore because the EBITDA multiple on a casino is different than the EBITDA multiple on an apartment, Mm -hmm. right? And some of these things have tremendously high value, uh, multiples normally when they're in the public markets uh, of the things that they'll develop. So some people will put those crazy multiples on it Mm -hmm. and maybe they're justified or not. So of all the companies uh that we talk about as like land whatever things i don't know if they have the best asset or sell at the biggest discount or something like that but they are doing what i would want to see more than anyone else mm-hmm. for the most uh there's actually some other one uh what is it frp holdings is that what it is it's the old florida rock they own apartment buildings now and um aggregate quarries that they're leasing out to companies in florida um to produce for them but they also do the same thing where if you want to see a company that I think is very smart in how they kind of just focus on creating value over time and don't care about whether it's reported, whether they confuse investors, all that kind of stuff, um, th- they uh, are th- the other example that I would say makes a lot of sense. So Canterbury Park and them are the two of public companies I know of that aren't considered like just real estate plays. Mm-hmm. That makes the most sense. There's plenty of other companies we won't name that I think do really dumb things that way. They lose a lot of money on taxes for, um, they issue shares at bad times. They do things basically to make it easier to explain things to investors. They talk more strategically like this is, you know, they want to have a clear strategy to present. Um, instead of just doing this, which is if it's a good asset, you hold on to it and you try to maintain some way to own it over time. You don't swap things for less than they're worth. You know, you try to get the most value over time, even though that can be confusing to investors. You run it like as if it, you owned all of it. What did you think of the card casino? Um, that, you know, those they are, benefit a lot in the past from the boom in poker. 
like 50, 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. 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 And they, they've they done okay basically ever since. since then. Yeah. They've kind done of okay. holding their own, but yeah. But it's all switched to table games and stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a tough regulatory thing and stuff. I mean, what's a casino worth? I don't know. I think it was worth a really high EBITDA multiple if you're not going to face more competition in the future. Uh, and I think it's worth a really low EBITDA multiple if someone's about to open a casino next to you. So it always depends on the regulatory situation and stuff like that. What if the casino next to you happens to be a tribal casino? Well, that's always been there, though. Sure. So they have a couple casinos within close distance to them, but it, it's always been there. For I was very shocked how close that was. I mean, sure, I knew it because of Google Maps and yeah. doing it and everything. But when we actually did the drive, I was like, yeah, this is very close. But a lot of people could say they don't exactly. I mean, I, I, they do compete, but the casinos are kind of going for a different customer. The tribe one is more slot machines yeah. and stuff like that. I would say the more serious poker players go to Canterbury Parks um, Casino. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think returns in gambling mostly come from just the regulatory environment that you have and what you're allowed to do and how many people are close to you that can do the same thing. I think there's kind of a certain pool that you're going to make. And as long as the state keeps the supply of ways to, you know, spend your money at a casino um, of all forms of gambling, as long as they keep that gambling pool that you have available lower than the demand, um, then you're going to do okay. You know, I mean, I don't, you know, I think all casinos, as long as there's a lack of supply, are good businesses. Virtu Motors, you have this on the sheet. People yeah, ask about I got a question about Virtu Motors. There's a blog post on nettosnotes.blogspot.com uh, about it. It's brief, but um, it, that was written up there before, too. Um you know, we've talked about virtue before. When people ask what's a value stock and things, the ones we're going over are all value stocks. And you can look at the multiples and see that. Whether they turn out well or not, their value, meaning generally low price to book, low PE, things like that. Um, virtue is like a lot of other car dealers where it's trading at pretty low price to book and actually now a low PE too. Um, and, you know, it's... Uh, if people think there's no value stocks left, it's an example of the kind of thing that is left. Um, since Brexit, um, since the uh, Brexit referendum went in favor of leaving, um, UK car dealers as stocks have been pretty cheap, and they haven't done that well for a long time. So their multiples kind of contracted and stayed down. So they've all been kind of value stocks that way. And I talked about another. Um, car dealer there cambria yeah there's others if so, anyone talks about virtue they always say why not cambria it's better yeah and i said i don't have a problem with that you know uh it might be gross better. faster yeah it might be better i don't know that it's not but it wasn't the one i chose full disclosure we do own virtue um, and don't own cambria yeah village supermarket yeah Your old friend village we got a question about this too so this, again, is a classic value stock now at this point, right? So what's the PE on it? 12 times. Okay. And price to book? Price to book, 0.9. The EV is probably miscalculated. So it's probably substantially less on an earnings basis, on an enterprise value basis than it appears to be because of the way it works if you look at their balance sheet. Their balance sheet's a little complicated. So they're a member of Wakefern, which is a co-op, and they have one part of that which is called uh, patronage dividend receivable. Um, that is not a real asset, I would say. It's their required investment in the co-op. So it's kind of like banks that are members, um, you'll see, have a stock in a business, theoretically, that has value for them, right? But the real purpose of it is just so that they can borrow from them. Okay. So, um, being a member bank that way. So you'll see that and it'll like count towards equity for regulatory purposes or whatever, but it's not really something that they could sell and still, um, operate the business the way they are. Same thing with Virtu being a member of a co-op. It's like being a member bank of something. You have to have that stock. However, there's other things with Wakefern that people may not realize are just cash. So they leave their cash at Wakefern instead of um, putting in the bank. They have receivables due from Wakefern instead of CDs from a bank. And they just earn like market rates. So it's as if you were a Domino's franchisee and you just threw money up to the corporate level to keep your money there. And it is similar to like a bank just leaving money at the Fed or something. Um, 
that's excess cash. They don't need that. And in fact, you can see now that they've refinanced some things and stuff they've borrowed and how low the rates are on their borrowing. So they're significantly overcapitalized versus what supermarkets normally look like. They did an acquisition, um, and we'll see how that goes. A bunch of things in how they've moved over time for me are, I'm not as sure business-wise if they're as good, um, but their store level stuff is going very well. Obviously did great during COVID um, because it was an essential business and all that. So they had for the first time in forever, a big same store sales jump. They were up 5%. Normally they're flat. I was going to say, so when you talk about the PE being a value stock and the price of book being a value stock, how much of that is like a normalized earnings because they did benefit like every other supermarket did through COVID? Yeah. I mean, you could use any past years of earnings other than taxes, all past years of earnings aren't that different. Mm -hmm. Um, you might, some stuff might look confusing because of tax issues and stuff like that, but they're operating. I mean, you can use the 10 year average operating Mm -hmm. income if you want, it would still be very cheap. Um, I don't know that, I mean, sales and gross profit would have benefited a bit from COVID, but they had extra costs. So the one that about this is like I've said for a long time, business wise, they seem to be doing okay. Their gross margin is as good as it usually is or better. And their um, turns are good too. So gross profit divided by net tangible assets in the business are really strong. Um, So there doesn't seem to be a big deterioration uh, competition wise, but they have become less efficient over time in terms of their GNA and all that. And some people would say that that part of that is their executive compensation, but Mm -hmm. that doesn't explain most of it. Um, They'd only be making maybe $7 million more if you took away like almost all that headquarters stuff for paying top management, fees of being a public company, you know, audit fees and things like that. So that only explains part of it. So I don't know all the details of why it's deteriorated over time. Why GNA as a percent of sales keeps going up. Most likely explanation is sales is barely budging. So GNA is just naturally going up more at a rate that you would expect. Again, if we have some inflation or something, would they benefit? Maybe. It's been such a bad 10 years for inflation in food that it's really hard to run a supermarket business. Mm Mm-hmm and get any higher same store sales. It's just nearly impossible. So you have to keep a really hard um, watch on GNA, right? Their food costs aren't high because there hasn't been inflation in that. So your, your gross levels can be okay. But if you're not careful, if your expenses as a business are rising as fast as other kinds of businesses, well, food sales aren't rising as fast as, you know, sales for any other kind of industry. Mm-hmm. Out of the three that we went over today, which one would you be most interested in? Alico, Canterbury Park, or Village Supermarket? Um, I don't know. They're all pretty similar in terms of their... Uh, yeah, I'd say they're all pretty similar. I would be um, probably more interested in Village or Canterbury. Um, but they're... Yeah, like on the price and stuff, they're pretty similar that way. Um, Virtu is the one I would be most interested in, I would say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Virtu too. Um, yeah, they, they're all fall into the same. I mean, they fall into the same value stuff is if you look historically, the, the big thing is like, so if we take out the commodity one, if we look at the other ones, what you'll see is the issue is growth stuff. So that's normally what happens with value stocks. People don't know how they're going to grow. Mm hmm because they haven't grown in the very recent past. And if you can figure out how they're going to grow or if they're going to buy back stock or pay dividends or whatever, then you'll be willing to buy it even though you don't see an obvious catalyst. Obviously, there's way more happening at Canterbury Park than there is at Village. That could be positive. So that's a possibility. Um, uh, with oranges and stuff, you know, they will have a good, this year will be good for them. That. I mean, because COVID caused a big jump in orange juice sales because people are staying home and drinking, you know, breakfast and drinking oranges for breakfast and stuff um, where they don't normally do that when they go to fast food. Um, And there was a decrease in supply because of weather. So because of that, you have a good year. But I have no idea how like the market will react to that. And that's a very one time sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, but they all fall in the same sort of category as value things is that it's there's not really a clear catalyst for most of them. Um, pretty low price to earnings, price to book, things like that. Uh, as far as the land stuff, that's more valuing on the market value. But that's what a lot of people use, like Gamco investors and stuff. That's how they think about it. Mm-hmm. Got it. 
cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us here today. If you want to support the podcast, hit the subscribe button, hit that subscribe button, hit that subscribe button. Leave us a rating and review on the iTunes app as well. We're definitely very appreciative of that. I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us, and we will see you in the next podcast.